All right. Good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for being here, and, and good to see everyone here. Um, my name is Michael Beckin. I uh, finished a PhD at University of Wisconsin-Madison earlier this year with my advisor, uh, Dr. Doug Soldat, who is actually giving the, the next presentation, so you'll hear from him next after me. But anyway, today I'll talk about uh, basically pathways to reducing uh, carbon emissions in, in golf course maintenance. So this conference is organized around the sustainable development goals. Um, which I think is a brilliant way to frame the conference because it gets us thinking in a big picture way about how we can manage turf better for our societies and for our environment. So this is a picture of people enjoying a turf grass surface in a park in Copenhagen, embodying you know, SDG3 of good health and well-being and part of a sustainable city and community. Uh, we also need to produ produce this turf grass surface using resources efficiently. Uh, like SDG 12 says, with re the responsible consumption and production of, of resources. And also, we need to take climate action. Um, can we produce this surface without any carbon emissions? And that's what I'm, uh, I would like to talk to you about today. So my PhD research was specifically about golf courses. So I'll, I'll talk to you about golf uh, today and aligning golf with SDG 13, which is taking climate action. Um, which, you know, I think the, the action point for us here with golf is to try to main golf courses with zero carbon emissions. So we're not adding to the climate problem. How do we do this? Well, I think we electrify maintenance equipment. We source electricity from low carbon sources. We're really efficient with our resource use. And I'll, I'll get into more detail uh, on that later in the, in the talk. Okay, so just a quick overview of uh, the carbon balance equation. You know, very simple. Basically, carbon balance is emissions minus sequestration. Uh, if you have emissions greater than sequestration, then you're going to be carbon positive. If, in the other case, you have sequestration greater than emissions, then you're going to be carbon negative. And emissions come thing from things like burning diesel, um, gasoline, production of fertilizer, and, and so on and so forth. OK, so here's a more detailed view of what our carbon emissions model looks like. I first started working on this when I worked at the Gulf Environment Organization uh, before graduate school. And they allowed me to keep using it and refining it uh, during grad school. So thanks to them for that. It's divided into eight main sections. So we, have, we account for emissions from electricity use. Um, also account for emissions from electricity production and, and transport, uh, emissions from fertilizer production, also denitrification on, on the golf course, um, fuel use, fuel production and transport, machinery, uh, production, transport, and repair, so that the whole life cycle of the machinery is included uh, in the model, uh, pesticide production, and lastly, the use of sand uh, the emissions to produce sand and transport it uh, to the golf facility is also included in the carbon emissions model. OK, a, a quick note about what the model does and does not include. Um, we are including emissions from the maintenance building, uh, the irrigation pump, maintenance equipment. Uh, so everything that it takes to maintain the golf course's turf surface. We don't include emissions from the clubhouse or other golf facility buildings um, or other operations. In terms of sequestration, it's the same. We look at uh, carbon sequestration of the turf grass. We don't look at, we don't consider uh, sequestration in non-turf areas. So the model is emissions from turf and the sequestration of turf. I thought I'd go through a quick example of, of what these calculations look like, just to give you more of a feel of what it actually looks like. It's actually pretty simple. So for something like fuel use, what you do is you take the amount of fuel that you're using times a carbon emissions coefficient, and that will give you um, your carbon emissions. So if we actually look at an example of that, let's say you use 7,000 liters of, of diesel in a year. The carbon emission coefficient for diesel is 2.6 uh, kilograms of CO2 per liter. Uh, you multiply those two together, then you get just about 18,000 kilograms of CO2 emitted from burning that diesel fuel. Gasoline, it's a similar example. The carbon emission coefficient for gasoline is slightly lower than diesel, but the equation is the same. And what's nice about this, you have gasoline and diesel. Those are different fuels, but if you, you can put them in the same unit of carbon dioxide, 
um, and then add them together. So that, for example, just in, in this example, we have total emissions from these two um, is about 30,000 kilograms of, of carbon dioxide. <coughs> Okay, so we ran the full model, not just fuel use, but all eight categories of the model on uh, four U.S. golf courses. And, and so now we see carbon emissions on the, the y-axis and those eight categories of the model uh, across the x-axis. And what you see here is that, oopsies, oop, oh, there we go, there we go, oh gosh. I'm getting confused. Okay, so what you see here is that electricity use and fuel use account for the majority of emissions on U.S. golf courses. Um, so that, you know, that was our finding. About 63% of emissions were from those two things. So if we want to reduce emissions, that's where we need to, to target our efforts. We also did these uh, calculations on three golf courses here in Europe. Uh, same model, same graph here. What you can see, though, is that emissions from electricity use are a lot lower. That's because the electricity grid in here in Europe has a much lower carbon cost than what the average is in the U.S. Uh, emissions from fuel use were pretty similar to, to the U.S., uh, but it turned out two of the three golf courses in our, in our study here in Europe were top-dressing fairways, They're using a lot of sand. And to mine, transport, and uh, apply all that sand comes with quite a carbon cost. So I realize this might not be statistically representative of Europe writ large, but it is just uh, a warning, if you will, that if you're using a lot of sand, that does come with a carbon cost. <clears throat> okay, here is the, uh, now basically we're looking at carbon uh, balance of, an, an average carbon balance of the four golf facilities that we had uh, in the U.S. So I'm going to talk through this graph. Basically, we have got emissions here on the, the blue at, or on the blue line. So what we did is we calculated emissions over a three-year period. We took an average, and then we assumed that the golf course is emitting that amount of carbon from the time that it opened to the age that it is currently. So that's why that this is cumulative emissions from the time the golf course opens. What we also did is we quantified sequestration. That is this red line here. And because we're taking carbon out of the atmosphere with sequestration, we count that as a negative number. And on all of the golf courses that we had in the US, they had been converted from agricultural land to a golf course. And when you do that, when you take agricultural land and convert it to a golf course, you get a rapid sequestration of carbon in the turf because agriculture typically depletes the soil of carbon turf grass is good at, at putting that carbon back, which is great. But the, the somewhat of a catch is that that carbon sequestration potential lasts for approximately the first 50 years, after which the soil reaches a new soil organic carbon equilibrium. You're not going to add carbon forever. You have this sort of asympto asymptotic relationship where after about 50 years, the soil comes to equilibrium in terms of how much carbon it has. And, uh, and levels off. <clears throat> so then if you look at, a car at the carbon balance, which is uh, emissions minus sequestration, what we find is that for the first 30 years of a golf course's operation, it's carbon negative. However, at 30 years, it becomes carbon neutral, and past that 30-year age, it becomes carbon positive because emissions are continuing to go up, but sequestration has leveled off. And so the older the golf course gets, the more and more carbon positive it becomes. Okay, so then the next question is, what do emissions levels need to be for a golf course to be carbon neutral over its life cycle? And that's the example that we'll go through now. So the average golf course is about 38 hectares of turf. Um, we're going to assume a 200-year golf course life cycle, which we think is, is reasonable. The sequestration capacity, if you assume that you're taking agricultural land and converting it uh, to um, golf, is approximately 160,000 kilograms of CO2 equivalents per hectare. Then uh, the yearly emissions for carbon neutrality over this 200-year period in this scenario are about, you have to emit about 800 kilograms of CO2 per hectare per year to be carbon neutral over the whole life cycle. However, in our study, we found that golf courses are emitting over 4,000 kilograms of CO2 equivalents per hectare per year. So what this means that 
is that emissions levels need to be reduced by 5.4 times from current levels for life cycle carbon neutrality of golf courses. And we need to reduce emissions more than that if we want golf courses to be carbon negative over their life cycle. And as you saw in our graph, fuel use was a major source of emissions uh, for golf, both golf courses in, in the US and in Europe. And so reducing fuel use uh, is one of the most effective ways for a golf course to reduce its carbon footprint, the fuel that we're using in utility vehicles, in mowing, uh, and so on. So here is a graph of um, basically fuel use across the eight different regions of our study. So many of you uh, in this room helped me with this, this study. So we have data from three uh, European countries, so Denmark, Norway, and the UK. Uh, and then we have uh, also data from five US regions. So East Texas, Florida, the Midwest of the US, Northeast and, and Northwest. Um, and what we have done here is basically look at fuel emissions on an area normalized basis. So we're looking at fuel emissions as a proportion of how much turf you're managing. But we're also correcting this for how long your season is, right? So maybe a golf course in Florida has a really long season, almost 320 days, let's say. And they're using more fuel because of that. Well, we're normalizing for that in this equation. So what we did is we used the pace turf growth potential model to calculate how many growing uh, days that you have in a year. And then we're normalizing that. Um, by fuel use. So what the metric here is, is kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalents uh, per hectare per day of, of turf grass growth. And what you can see here is that emissions from fuel use, uh, this is the median here in the middle, and that's what is best to compare across all these regions. Uh, none of these are statistically different. Uh, I'll take questions at the end. <laughs> or, sorry, do you want to just right now? Uh, so it's for it's normalized by the amount of turf that you have. So yeah, it, it's all all sizes of golf courses. Yep. Yeah. So it's the amount of carbon that you have divided by the turf grass area divided by the number of days that you're you're open. Okay. So uh, CO two emissions. Uh, yeah. So basically. Electrifying maintenance equipment is, is very important um, to reducing carbon emissions on, on golf courses because it allows us to uh, use less fuel. But there's also a carbon cost to generating electricity. And so that's what we show on this graph is basically how much carbon does it take to generate one kilowatt hour of electricity. And you can see here this different countries around the world. Um, we, we, as you can see here, some countries have a very low uh, amount of carbon generated per kilowatt hour. So Norway, Sweden, Switzerland, Finland. Um, this is where basically sourcing your electricity is, is very carbon um, efficient. In these countries that are circled in yellow, the um, electricity is slightly more carbon intense. And then the countries in red, you have basically a high degree of carbon. Uh, produced f per kilowatt hour. So like in China, burning a lot of coal to get electricity. So you have about 0.7 kilograms of CO2 equivalents per kilowatt hour uh, produced. OK, so I wanted to run through another hypothetical scenario here uh, of the amount of emissions that you could save by uh, electrifying maintenance equipment as opposed to using a, a gasoline um, Mower. So in our hypothetical scenario here, we're comparing gasoline uh, triplex to an electric triplex greens mower. We're doing um, mowing greens for one year. Uh, but on average, we have 200 greens mowing event, events in this scenario and 1.2 hectares of greens. And here are the results. So this is the emissions from mowing greens in one year, total amount of carbon dioxide emitted. Here's the amount of emissions that you would emit if you're using a gasoline triplex. Uh, here are the emissions from the electric triplex. So even in China, where you're burning a lot of coal to produce the electricity that is powering your greens mower, you're still cutting emissions in half from what you would use from a gasoline model. 
If you go to uh, the US, you're using even less. If you come here in Denmark, you're using even less. And if you're in Norway, where most of the electricity in Sweden too, where most of the electricity comes from hydropower, you're almost emitting nothing in the maintenance of the vehicle. That, this is where we want to be. This is fantastic. So, <laughs> Okay, so uh, fairways and roughs account for a lot of uh, the area that we mow. So we have uh, electric greens mowers, which is great, but we also want to be uh, reducing emissions from the, you know, the majority of what we're mowing, which is fairways and roughs. So it's, you know, an important part of the turf grass industry's future that we uh, have electric, rough, and fairway motors. That's a, a critical next step to reducing um, golf course uh, carbon emissions. So, and then I just wanted to sort of end here with what currently is and is not electrified. So, uh, walk mowers are electrified, triplex mowers, walk behind mowers, um, bunker raking tractors, yes. Aerators, I nope. Um, utility vehicles, yes. Sprayers and spreaders, I don't think so. You can correct me on, on that if I'm wrong. Hybrid, uh, fairway mowers, we do have some hybrid models, not anything fully electric on the market yet, to my knowledge. Rough mowers, no, and banks and surround mowers, um, not yet either. So, you know, progress that we can make as an industry on that front. <coughs> okay, some conclusions. So, carbon emissions from golf course maintenance primarily derive from fuel use, uh, but in some cases, materials such as sand use can contribute greatly to emissions. Uh, carbon emissions from golf course turf grass maintenance need to be reduced if we're going to be carbon negative over our life cycle. And electrification of maintenance equipment greatly reduces emissions no matter how much carbon uh, is, is used uh, in, in producing electricity, um, like I showed you uh, in China and Denmark and so on. I just, and just to reiterate, electrification is critical. So that's, that's what I want to leave you with. Lastly, I just want to thank everyone who uh, participated in my uh, PhD resource use survey. So the, the work that I showed you today is just the energy component of, of the survey that I did. Many of you here helped me with the survey, thank you. Uh, but we also did work on water, fertilizer, pesticide, BMPs, uh, demographic um, information about golf, um, so, which I'd be happy to talk to you about at a, at a later time if, if you're interested. So thanks so much for listening. Thank <laughs> you.